trust that the easy button got it started. Uh, so we run the TAP program. Uh, we run customer meetings many times a week with each team uh, that we help represent. And uh, Joey's got a session later this week on uh, exactly what the process looks like. So he can go into a lot more detail. Uh, I'm also the team architect, so I advise large global customer projects. Uh, and that's, that's been a lot of fun. We've been advising a lot of hybrid uh, cloud scenarios lately. So. Um, we also create content and anything that will help accelerate adoption. Uh, so whether it's just sit down with a customer who's looking at a new project, they just want to say, hey, what do you think about this? Is this the right approach? You know, I'm stuck on this one thing. How do you help me get over the hurdle? Uh, or in the case of DSC, about a year ago, we sat down with the DSC team and said, you know, what do you need to start accelerating adoption throughout this? And they said, you know, we really need a lot of DSC resources. So our team started writing DSC resources and found a bunch of other people who could write DSC resources and started pumping as much as we could in the library. So that's been a lot of fun and gave us a lot of experience. Uh, so these are our main topics. Uh, I'm going to get into this one here in a second. We talked a little bit about, I'm actually just going to skip this slide. So what we learned designing first party workloads for CPS, and I'm actually going to do this sort of Tarantino style. I'm going to kick off the demo first. to get the monitors to come back. <coughs> uh, I see what's happening here. Okay, that's fine. All right. So I uh I wanted to be able to demonstrate what it looks like if you're using SMA plus DSC to provision VM roles. I needed some extra hardware, so I emailed a friend and got us a whole CPS rack for the afternoon. So if you need a million dollars worth of hardware to go run your demo on, let me know and uh, we'll, we'll get you set up. So in this case, I am a tenant for a service provider. I'm going to add a new subscription. Uh, we can do dedicated exchange. You can see we've got a bunch of test scenarios on here, but we've got SQL Exchange and SharePoint. And I'm just going to kick that off. Now we're going to come back to this, so I'm going to leave it in the background. And now we're going to come back to our content. So here's our problem statement. Uh, so about this time last year, the CPS team, actually it was about the middle of the summer, I guess, the CPS team came to us as the CAT team and said, hey, TechEd Europe's coming up, we're going to be talking a lot about CPS. You know, it would be nice when we're doing demos in the CPS platform, if we went to the gallery for there to be some stuff there, uh, and not just be, hey, can you deploy an empty VM? And we said, yeah, sure, we can help with that. We've built a bunch of service templates, and we've played around with VM roles, and yeah, we could do a lot for you. Uh, so we started looking at what's the right way to do this, and we <laughs> figured, well, for dedicated hosting scenarios, people aren't going to want just example VMs, right? They're going to want to know if I'm a hoster and I'm going to put Exchange or SharePoint or SQL on this, um, how do I do this in a supported way? How do I do this in a way that'll scale, not just another example? So the first thing we ran into, uh, you know, we're using WAP. VM roles are the way that you deploy these scenarios and these workloads onto CPS. Well, VM roles were inherently single tier. Uh, you could laterally scale them, which means you could deploy uh, a concept into a VM role and you could say I want more of those or you could increase the size of it but there wasn't a really good way to say I've got a web tier and a data tier or middleware and things like that that, that chain together. Um, <coughs> that was really a requirement for a lot of things we wanted. We wanted to be able to say you're going to need a network, you're going to need Active Directory, you're going to need Exchange, if it's SharePoint you might have multiple tiers of that. We went and talked to each of those teams and they said yeah you're right that's the way you should do it. And so we ran into a bunch of hurdles. So our mission was to uh, deliver a supported way of doing this, and the scope was to do it on WAP. Uh, we very quickly identified SMA and DSC at that point in time as being technologies we should be focused on if we're going to be tooling up to solve this problem. And here's what we learned. So yes, VM roles with a delivery mechanism. Um, <coughs> everything that we could uh, automate using DSC on the inside of the VM role, that's how we end up doing it. In some cases, we even took functionality that the VM role would have provided, like joining a domain, and we shifted that over into DSC for consistency's sake. 
Uh, we wanted it to be something that would be portable where you could take the knowledge gained out of building these configurations and move it to Azure or move it to future versions of WAP. So we didn't want to be close, uh, tied too closely to that you know, specific functionality. Um, we also recognized the need, like I said, for things like layering. So SMA started taking on more and more duties as we continued prototyping out more advanced scenarios. So DSC was the common denominator. Um, SMA, and I'm actually going to sit down next week and prototype out this even further, uh, but we started looking at SMA as pre and post tasks. So before I'm ready to do my deployment, what needs to happen in the environment? After the deployment happens, are there follow-up tasks that need to occur? Going out and configuring a load balancer, going out and setting up DNS records, things like that. So SMA has turned out to be a, a good tool for that. And this was the number one thing that we learned, uh, that everything inside the VM would be handled by DSC. Everything outside the VM would be handled by SMA. That was almost universal truth. Uh, there are cases where it would make sense for SMA to reach into the VM to handle very transactional uh, type occurrences, changing passwords, things like that. But for deployment scenarios, this became uh, pretty universally true. The, the one thing I want to prototype next week is uh, for pre-deployment tasks like making sure certificates are in place that will be fed into the DSC configuration should SMA pick up some of those. But even for those things, I'm thinking about having multiple DSC configurations chained together instead of uh, you know, purely abandoning this idea. So this was our number one topic, or our, our number one concept that we pulled out of it. So let's switch back over. And you can I see... Think that, I think that's a really Yeah. Orchestration and configuration management are two, are, are two different things with some overlap. And, you know, making that delineation, at least in your operation, gives you a starting point to have that debate. Should we have VSC? Should we have some uh, SMA or some other orchestration? Yep. Yeah, it's the whole idea of <coughs> like transactional occurrences versus declaring something's true uh, and separating out the, the duty. Yes, sir? Right. It was a huge issue for us as well. Um, the way we've solved it for this stuff is everything is inside the <coughs> VM role, and that's different than what you're saying. Uh, so the question was, if you're in an NBRG, if you are in an NBGRE network, and you as a hoster do not have administrative control over the VM, uh, and you may not even have access to the VM at all if it's in a completely isolated software-defined network, then how do you go about getting DSC into it? And so initially, it's all payload within the VM role. Uh, the other things that we had thought about would be you could provision a DSC pull server into each tenant and then publish access to it through NBGRE, and at least that way you cut down on the number of instances you have to reach into. So you could publish, you could update your modules, you could publish new configurations and sort of fan that out inside. Um, you, we also have talked to hosters who have had the idea of having a DSC service that spans multiple tenants. And so that's why I really like the idea of, of building your own private feeds. You could actually have one NuGet feed for your DSC module effort and have that span many tenants. Uh, now configurations are very security minded, so you're probably always gonna wanna drive that directly in to the tenant atmosphere. You could publish WinRM for every VM to make it accessible for the, you know, for the, the hoster to reach in, um, but there's a layer of access there that a lot of tenants may not be comfortable with. So. Cool. There was one other question. Okay, maybe we answered it. Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, you find like using, like using SMA to do some of the work orchestration around it. Does that help you cut out using the, uh, like the wait for all sort of resources? And that's yes. Easy way to yes. In fact, I'll, I'll go into painful detail about how that works. <laughs> all right, so we checked in. Uh, oh, sorry. So we do have, it's, both say provisioning. So what we can see right here is the network's been created uh, and both Active Directory and Exchange are provisioning. And, and I'll come back to 
your point, which is why that matters. So right now, the way that this is modeled out, and all of this stuff is publicly available right now, and I'll show you the links at the end. Oh, sorry. With the, uh, dedicated tenant hosting, uh, you you could use this solution to span multiple tenants, but that's where you would get into uh, like having a private feed that spans multiple tenants and managing it that way. Yeah. As a, as a tenant, that would terrify. As a tenant, you don't care about what? No, as a tenant, having the hoster insert in would terrify me. Yes. Because that's the whole purpose of being a tenant. Yeah. So the so. Let's go through this slide and that explains that a little bit. Uh, the idea is that that's the reason that initially we put all the payload in the VM role because this was a scenario where they, the hosters were saying uh, it's, it's our value add to the tenant to say we're not just going to give you an empty VM. As you trigger and you get provisioned, it's also going to include Active Directory, it's going to include Exchange, things like that. And so once they're provisioned, they're yours to manage. So we kind of get into these scenarios of whether or not the, the service provider would have access to the, the tenant VMs after they're provisioned. The scenario that this is actually deploying is no, they wouldn't. So all the payloads encapsulated by that VM role, once it comes online, it's a handoff. Uh, but I'm talking about with the pull server inside, then you could get into, because I've actually talked to, scenarios about, to service providers about this a lot, and for, especially in the dedicated space, they're finding it's different from customer to customer. So one customer will say, you absolutely cannot have access to any of my VMs whatsoever. The next will say, actually, I'd like you to take, off, or to, to take on patching for me, because I don't want to think about patching anymore. Well, then they have to have access, and they got to negotiate that in the contract, and it's, it's a whole thing. So. Um, so yeah, this is triggered by subscription of the plan. Uh, if we were to go back and re-architect this again, we would have done it differently. We would have actually created resource definitions that collected a lot of uh, data that was not necessarily associated with that one VM role and then used SPF to pump all that through the deployment. Um, but this way it works. So the way that, what that means is when you saw me click on, I'm gonna subscribe to a plan, it gave them the whole environment. Uh, you, there's actually some more flexible ways that we could get, go into that. But it deploys the network. It, it, uh, SMA is basically kicking off multiple VM roles. So it's just timing that out. Uh, and then it's handling the post-deployment tasks. So this will go through the painful level of detail I was gonna mention. By the way, before I go off this slide, uh, we also have published tenant deprovisioning. So the way that WAP worked originally with VM roles is if the tenant just went in and removed their subscription, it left all those artifacts hanging out in VMM. So there's run books that, are, that have been uh, published now that would go in and clean up after that tenant whenever they removed their subscription. So this is the painful level of detail. There's two slides in a row. So we start off, the, the tenant comes in and they click through WAP and they initiate their subscription. Uh, WAP actually handles, uh, or the WAP infrastructure handles going in and making sure that that network has been created. Um, actually what happens is a run book kicks off that, that's based on that dot create uh, trigger and that goes in and makes the WAP call that creates that new virtual network. Uh, it then initiates the VM role deployments. So we're associating that I want to be an exchange tenant with, uh, you're going to need both Active Directory and Exchange. You could also do, I want all collaboration workloads, so give me Exchange, SharePoint, and Link, or I want all data workloads, so do SQL and two other things, or whatever the case might be. We're the, the runbooks are monitoring those VM roles as they go through their progression of deployment. Once they have completed, um, then DSC is embedded within the VM role, so that machine comes online and DSC is handling everything. So it's uh, if it's got to create a domain, it, cr it creates the new domain controller. If it's a second domain controller, that's where those wait for concepts come into play. So it's, you know, okay, I, I can't become the second domain controller until the first domain controller is finished. When it gets to exchange, I, you know, I, I can't become an exchange server until the exchange <coughs> schema uh, ha has actually been published in. So there's a lot of wait for resources involved. And what's interesting is SMA and DSE don't know that each other are happening. So you have SMA taking these tasks, like I'm gonna deploy the VMs and then I'm gonna deploy the second instance. Uh, or in this case, I'm going to go in and create a fixed size data disk. 
one of the things that the workload teams like Exchange and SharePoint and Link were saying is, uh, we don't want dynamically expanding disks for the data volumes supporting our workloads. We just want a fixed size VHD. And at that point in time, WAP didn't support fixed size VHD. So then we were kind of out of blocker. So these uh, run books actually just call back into VMM after the VM role has been deployed and add that VHD. Inside the VM, DSC is using wait for disk. So before the exchange install would kick off, wait for disk is happening. Then X disk goes in and configures the, the data volume so that it's accessible and all that. Then exchange can actually kick off and complete the install. Uh, so your application deployment starts up. Once it's completed, uh, there are run books that handle notification. They're not turned on for this demo, but uh, you can get, have the, your tenant get emails that yes, your subscription has started and then it looks like your applications are now available. And that was just doing a simple monitor looking for, in that case, OA to be available for the Exchange server. Um, at that point, one of the things that the CPS team has since added is uh, obviously natting out that, what, that workload through NBGRE so that it's accessible you know, from the internet or wherever your hosting environment might be. Um, they've also added network load balancing, so it's going in and configuring uh, load, an F5 load balancer endpoint and making sure that it's actually allowing uh, VMM to complete that. Should be one more. And then your notifications are sent out to the user. So that's a linear way of looking at it that wraps around the slide. Here's a way to look at it as you're deploying out the entire infrastructure. So your subscription is triggered, that first domain controller comes, or the, the network is, in, is created, that first domain controller comes online. The second domain controller is also, actually what happens uh, in this scenario is all of those VMs are provisioned as soon as that network's available. And the reason is we tried doing this in series where everything was waiting for the next thing before it even started, and we were just wasting a ton of time deploying operating systems. So we said, why not just parallel all of this? Once our subscription has started, the network's been provisioned, just go ahead and create all the VMs. So that's where things like wait for domain came in really handy because all of those machines can go ahead and get installed. If there's any prerequisites that they need that don't have a domain requirement, they can even process all of that stuff. That first domain controller gets created. Now the second domain controller, as soon as that domain is available, can come online and, and complete that. But the mailbox servers realistically don't have to wait for the second domain controller just to, for a deployment scenario. We know it's going to be available. So as soon as the domain is available, yes, you can go ahead and extend the schema. You can start installing Exchange. Uh, once the mailbox servers were online, then we can start bringing on the CAS boxes. Um, you know, SQL probably is well on its way by that point. And then SharePoint has a tiering system of its own. So you create the back end instances. Uh, then you can move into to creating the front ends and, and the search roles and things like that. Uh, so on the DSC side, it's going through, doing all the configuration, running setup. Uh, as the disks become available, I mentioned after the VMs are deployed, SMA was actually associating data volumes with all these VMs. DSC is waiting for that and incorporating that into the sequence of things that needs to happen for that application to get installed. Um, meanwhile, SMA is doing things like handling you know, your NAT rules and, uh, and following on. So you really have these two things working together in parallel that aren't aware of each other, but they can look for signals from each other. So, you know, DSC can say, oh, my disk just showed up, now I'm ready to go on my next step. So one of the things that was interesting, when we started off, like I said, we, we tried it the hard way first, and then we moved towards a parallel effort. Uh, at first we started off, we just had two VMs, because we were just gonna say, hey, it, it is what it is, right? We're just gonna not have multi-tier, we'll just have one domain controller and then we'll kick off one exchange server and then we'll see how it goes. And it was taking an hour and 20 minutes to deploy out Active Directory and then deploy out exchange for them to become available. Uh, once we moved to the parallel role, we were doing three times the number of VMs. We also increased our disk size from 40 gig to 250 gig times two per VM. Um, and we actually shaved 20 minutes off of our deployment time just by virtue of saying, just go ahead and deploy it all out and then hydrate things as they're, as they're available. So these are the scenarios we came up with uh, for the design principle or for the model. One would be you don't automate anything. So they hit subscribe, they have a subscription. They can click on network, it creates it, they can click on the VM roles themselves, point and click their way through and, and get everything happy. The next would be what we call semi-automation. Uh, so the idea is when you get your subscription, you get your network. You might also get your domain. Uh, so you, the idea is we're gonna stub in everything that you would need to get started. So here's your network. Yes, you've got a domain that's available. You can start incorporating that. You deploy the applications on your own. 
And then you have this concept of full automation, which is everything, either you get all of Exchange, you get all of SharePoint, maybe you want all of Exchange and SharePoint integrated together, all ready to go. And then like I mentioned before, that could be just a handoff or it could require further management as you keep going. Um, we also got into this concept of t-shirt sizing. And so this became kind of interesting. This is where I got into what would we do differently. Uh, so what you could do is say, we're gonna go ahead and let the subscription happen. We'll give you our network. When you go into VM role, we're just gonna give you descriptions of VM roles that sound like a whole environment. And then that first VM role is gonna have a form that collects lots and lots of data. That's all built into Windows Azure Pack, so you could do that. Normally that form collects data that it just hands off to the uh, resource extension and it does something with it and that's how your installation happens. What you could do, since all of that data from the form is exposed back in through SPF and SMA sees all of it, you could say, I'm just gonna collect all the data that I need for a domain, for exchange, for SharePoint, whatever, and then I'm gonna let SMA sort it all out and do all the work. Um, and if we were to go back and redo it again, we think after doing it the first time, you always go back and say, nah, I would have completely changed it if I was to do it a second time. Uh, that was number one thing, is, is uh, we would have based it on VM roles. Because in your form, you could say, here's my t-shirt sizes for environments. Or you could build in a calculator if you really wanted to be interesting. So you could say, in the form, I'm gonna collect how many users are in your environment. And then in SMA, in your runbooks, you could say, well, if it crests over 200, now you're gonna need more Exchange servers. If it goes over 1,000, you're gonna need more Exchange servers and more SharePoint servers. If it goes past 5,000, you know, don't even deploy it, let somebody know, because they should go talk to them before we deploy a 5,000 know, know, user subscription. So uh, there, there's kind of unlimited things that you could do there. And let me just make sure we're doing okay on time. Awesome. I'm going to switch back over. Yeah, so these are all provisioning. I will just real quick take a look before I hit refresh. So in VMM, it looks like the jobs have moved out of the queue. Hey, Exchange failed. But you have Active Directory. It never goes perfectly whenever you're showing it to somebody else. So if you go out to Web Platform Installer, uh, we published all of the runbooks that we use to create this environment. We've published all the DSC configurations, all the DSC modules. Uh, the X Exchange artifacts, you know, were work, being worked on at about the same time as this. Uh, so the X Exchange is already in the, the DSC resource kit, but X Disk, X, X Wait for Disk, disk um, I think Pending Reboot, Quite a few of the DSC resource kit contributions at that point in time were just coming out of this effort to you know, get things going for CPS. There are, I think, three uh, specific blog posts on Building Clouds blog now on this topic, uh, specifically around how this works on CPS. So there's this one whenever Exchange was first released and then they've come back now and they've documented out uh, how it works for SharePoint, how it works for Link or for SQL. Um, and if you go back, Charles actually had, had published out a lot of detail about how these run books work. And we just did our check-in. We're going to come back. I'll come back and look at it again. So the two other topics I wanted to cover, and we are doing great on time, um, is private feeds and the IIS handling. So private feeds is something um, I'll just go ahead and let you know now. So I'm, I'm working on a white paper for DSC pull server. And the idea is uh, a lot of feedback we had from customers was pull server is really great, but we need formal documentation on this if this is a role that we're going to support. Um, so that's pretty close. We'll probably release it within the next day or so. I might just release it tonight. We'll see how it goes. Um, one of the things I found along the way is we're also going to need an operations guide. So what does it look like if you are managing that DSC pull server in an environment? You know, here's how to plan for it, how to configure it, how to install it. I think it needs a sister white paper, which is what are the processes you're gonna go through to incorporate that into your environment? Um, originally, I was gonna talk a lot about test automation and doing validation of your modules and things like that as you're writing them. Uh, Steven is actually gonna cover that, I think, tomorrow. So, I'll, I'll uh, test validation, uh, automated testing, Wednesday, perfect. So I took that 
out of the things I wanted to cover in this, and we're going to focus in on using private feeds. I actually think this is something that almost everyone's eventually going to want, uh, but I didn't realize it until I started prototy prototyping it out myself. So the idea of a private feed uh, just means that you've got a NuGet service running. And I actually discovered that there's quite a few public services that are available that I really liked. Uh, you could also just spin this up on your own IIS box. And the reason to have this is uh, if you've played around with OneGet and PowerShell Get, it's having your own repository. So just like you would use PowerShell Get to go out to the internet, connect in, say, hey, I want the latest DSC module for you know, X SQL PS or X Active Directory, uh, what you're all going to eventually want is to say, there's a bunch of stuff out there on the internet. We pulled it down. We took a look at it. We maybe tweaked it for our environment, or we just said, yep, nothing in here is going to hurt us in any way. And then we republished it into our own gallery. And that starts to sound like, oh, man, there's a whole lot of stuff going here. The truth is it's actually pretty straightforward. And I think we'll actually, as an industry, get to the point where this is a one-click process for most people. Um, I also think it's interesting, so I put on here that isolation is not necessarily a requirement. So what you might find is uh, maybe you have a private, well, I actually think what's going to happen is you'll have a uh, one feed that's like your dev feed. So it's early access to anything within your organization that you're, it's kind of an in progress uh, set of tools that you're making available via PowerShell. And then you might have a private feed that is your production feed. And maybe you don't give everybody access to your dev feed, but everybody knows how to get access or it's automatically registered on their machines uh, to get access to the production feed. Uh, you may also have a publicly available feed where you say, we've written a bunch of DSC resources. Uh, maybe we contribute to them to, to GitHub. We you know, make them available and Microsoft has accepted them. Uh, but we might also have you know, just some cases where we want to host and make available a new get feed of tools that we just want to share with the world. And we're just going to own it ourselves. All of that's possible as well. There's really nothing holding any of you back from, from doing anything. Yes, sir? So one thing that's really important, the feed concept, is you don't want to have your deployments hamstrung by the internet. Right. If you rely on anything that's sitting out on the internet somewhere as part of your deployment process, whether it's chocolatey, whether it's PowerShell Get, whether it's uh, NuGet.org, you don't want to have your ability to deploy new infrastructure hamstrung by the internet and decide to not, like, not cooperate that day. That's why you want to have a feed that you control. Regardless of whether you're in a cloud environment or whether you're in a data center somewhere, regardless of what your proxy requirements and everything are, you want to have a private feed so that the internet does not control when you can deploy, you do. Yes, so for, for the, for the, the WSUS server. For the sake of recording, yeah, it's exactly like WSUS server. For the sake of the recording, uh, that was Stephen Murawski talking and his comment was, <coughs> you're not going to want your production deployments to have to rely on the internet being available. So that's one of the reasons why you may want to host this yourself on an IIS feed that's within your enterprise or within your data center so that you always have complete control end to end over your deployment process. Or within your cloud environment. Yes, absolutely. So one of the nice things you get out of this, and I say here the goal is ubiquity, as soon as someone says, oh, I just found that there's a bug in our tool, so I want to publish out a fix uh, to, to make that just universally available. No one has to stop and think, how do I get access to the latest tool, or how do I get access to the latest DSC module? Hey, Steve, are you still working on that, or did you make it available yet? As soon as he checks that in, let it go through a QA process and make it available. And when I say universally available, I mean whether you go to PowerShell Get, or you want to incorporate that into something else. Uh, so why should your pull server have to wait for you to go in and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna manually go do a PowerShell get, get the module, and then repackage it on the pull server. Uh, that should be something that should be completely automated as well. So I've got a project site in GitHub right now, and all of the script samples that I'm gonna use today are out there, as well as just a write-up about how I think this uh, would end up playing out. Uh, I've prototyped out, I haven't published my app bayer script yet, but I've got a script for the myget build service. Um, all these things are doing is building a new spec file and then generating the new get package and then letting the, the feed take that over. So uh, it was not a big project to write it up. Uh, you'll find that this is really easy to understand. And I'm actually going to try and convince my machine not to have multiple monitors for a second, maybe. Uh, maybe not. All right, 
I'll just use two monitors, it's fine. So I'm going to start off by letting my machine search for uh, an X test module. Yes. Well, let me switch to Windows because I'm, I'm going to come back. The only thing I needed it for was to show that text right there. I want to switch over here and I'll make this text bigger. So this is a posh git section, uh, session. So you can see I'm in the folder for that get to get project. Uh, all I've done is in that folder, I have dragged in another folder called X test module two. So you saw I, from my machine, I did a search. Uh, it actually would have queried the PowerShell online, the, the PowerShell gallery that's hosted by the PowerShell team, as well as I have a, a PowerShell repository or a, a PowerShell get repository registered on my machine so that it's gonna go search that as well. And it's marked as trusted. Uh, so in this case, I've come in, I've decided, hey, I created another module. I actually wanna check that in. So I'm gonna do a get push. And what's happening right now is the get client, uh, it's gonna ask for my username and password which hopefully obfuscates. Nice. And if I got that right, it will do the upload. Hey, and everything gets published. Now, as soon as that happens, all of these build services have this concept of a web hook. So as soon as you go in and sign up, uh, in this case, I am looking at uh, the MyGet service. And this was just a free service for me to, you know, I actually was thinking originally that I was going to build this out on an IIS box and do the whole thing manually end to end. And I came across this and was like, well, this will host it for me for free, so I guess I'll just use this for a rapid prototype. And then the more that I started looking at it, the more I liked it. Uh, so if I go in and look at, and they've got a preview build service, uh, their webhook is just looking at that. You can see it's already queued up. And if I go look at a previous build, this will get into what Steven is presenting on Wednesday. But all that it's doing is taking a build.ps1 file that it finds in the repo. And if I go down here, um, just within these lines is the entirety of that build script where it's coming in and saying, okay, I'm gonna create the new get package, and then it creates it. And all it's really doing is uh, interrogating the module manifest, looking for the version. It gets the name uh, from the module manifest as well, and then it just creates that new get package. And as soon as that new get package is available, you can see it's building right now. Should only take a minute, okay. Now if I get another search, I should find all three modules. So the idea is the people who are consuming your tools, whether it's DSC modules or a, just a tool that you go check into your repo, or if you have multiple repos, they just have PowerShell Get. So when they go do a find module, they're gonna go look for the latest version and what's available, things like that. It's literally just a, a way to go search for the latest version of your tools. So if you have a repo, and it could actually, it doesn't have to be GitHub, uh, it could be a local, Git uh, instance that you host, it could be TFS. It doesn't have to be one of these sophisticated build services. So one of the things I'm gonna prototype out as well is using SMA as that build service. Uh, because in this case, I'm really not compiling an application. It's really not building uh, an application. It's just saying, go look in this set of folders, go find a bunch of PowerShell modules, repackage them as NuGet packages, and then publish them into this feed. That's a set of things that are easily handled by a script. So SMA runbooks could handle that just as well. Uh, it's not necessarily that it's any better, it's that a lot of IT pros would have more familiarity looking at runbooks than they would have looking at a build service uh, that's more of a developer concept. So this was really interesting to me. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I think what a lot of people will end up with as a design pattern is that maybe you, know, you have that initial check-in, uh, you know, you have the concepts like Steven's going to get into that says I automatically do a QA on anything I publish before it goes live, uh, but that probably might, you know, just, or it might just go into my dev feed initially. Uh, there are capabilities within that service as well as others to say I want to host multiple feeds 
and then either via script, via some additional check, whatever the case may be, stair step it through. So either I manually go in and approve it from my production feed or it might go through some additional checks. Maybe it gets a pester check for you know, script quality, then it goes to dev, and then it spins up VMs in Azure, does a red light, green light check to make sure that those new modules didn't destroy the VMs and that they came back configured correctly, and then it goes to production. There's all kinds of things you could, you could play with there. Yes, sir? Yes. So here's what you need. Let me come back to that in just a second because I've got an answer for that as well. So this is just a diagram of what that looks like. The idea is to automate the process all the way around. So the only thing that you should have to do is commit to that repository. As soon as that module is, is checked in and you've done a push, or somebody else comes along and says, hey, I think I found a bug in your script. I'm gonna actually fix that for you and then send you a pull request and you just accept the change, then the rest just happens for you. So if that test automation fails, it would not move it forward. Uh, and I actually think this is an area that's gonna evolve as well. And there'll be a bunch of modules, you know, Pester obviously is a huge advancement there uh, to say, we're gonna get better and better at testing because if we're gonna make lots of small changes all the time, instead of waiting until the third Thursday of the month for the change window and things like that, then those tests are gonna be really important. And just like it took a long time for us all to get really good at monitoring, uh, it'll take a long time for us to get really good at test automation. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about how that's going to play itself out. Uh, you know, there's going to be an outage because somebody checked in a, a bad script and then they go back and update the test script and now we're better and, you know, all those types of things. I haven't ever thought to check for that. Uh, so assuming it passes, it automatically gets published to the feed. Now it's always available for your install module command. Now what you need is a set of scripts that update your pull server. I hadn't thought about your runbook workers, but yes, absolutely, that would count as well. Uh, and then it would flow all the way back to your target nodes. So here's what we learned out of this prototype effort. As we were writing the pull server document, uh, definitely figured out that pull server needs a connection uh, to the feed. And I spent about a day playing around with all different ideas and then it hit me, I should just make a one get provider for this. That would just make this really, really simple. Uh, so it took me, I don't know, a couple hours one morning and I just wrote the one get provider. It was super, super easy. And I uh, got a hold of Garrett that's been developing OneGet, and he said, wow, that's probably the fastest that anybody's written a provider. Good job, let me take a look at it. So he's got a couple of improvements he's gonna make, uh, but I think we've been trading notes back and forth. I'm probably just gonna go ahead and put it on GitHub and just document out the issues lists, and uh, you guys can see it as it goes through development, uh, or even start tinkering around with it. But all it's really doing is connecting to that feed, and then pulling down uh, you, you would just give it a, whatever you want, right? I want this module, and either I want the latest version or I want this specific version, and that one get provider will just go get it. It'll repackage it into the zip file that's needed for your pull server, and then it'll create the checksums uh, so that you, your pull server can provide validation of those modules. Uh, the next part of that, which Joey actually already has uh, stubbed into GitHub as well, would be a DSC module for PowerShell Package Manager. So then you can just say in your configuration that you define to automate the deployment of your pull server, here are the modules that I want to be available on this pull server. And you could just say in that configuration, I want these modules and these versions. And the DSC script would just go get it from your private feed and build your pull server completely for you. Uh, so that works. And then if you wanted to not specify a version and always have it go get the latest, you could do that. Uh, with the latest version of WMF, it will actually include all of them so that your configuration is downstream, can still specify individual versions and you could have all of them be available or you could specify specifics. Um, the next things that I figured out were if you wanted to deploy a pull server end to end, there were a couple of resources you needed that we didn't give you yet. Uh, so I've written them all, and I will put those on my GitHub repo tonight during the hackathon. You guys can take a look at them, and we'll get those checked into the resource kit as well. One is you need an SSL certificate. So I wrote a DSC resource <coughs> called xCertificate that has an xcert rec, just like certrec.exe, and it just automates contacting within your domain, going out. But it generates certificate request, submits it. Uh, it actually uses, for those of you who are familiar with PDT, and that that's becoming a set of DSC resources, we refer to it as XPDT, uh, it uses the XPDT common module so that it can do uh, uh, credential handling, and so it, it, you, you tell it who do you want 
which user account do you want to use to go get the certificate request? Because machine accounts by default don't have permissions to the SSL or the web server uh, certificate template. And it completes the certificate request, brings it back and installs it. So you just say, here's the FQDN of my server, here's the root certificate name, and here's the subject I want in that SSL cert, and it does that for you. The next thing that I found is whenever I got to the XDSC web service uh, module, that it only accepted a uh, thumbprint, which you don't know until you get your certificate. So I added a parameter to it, so it would accept subject name. And so for your thumbprint ID, you just put in whatever you want, like the word subject, and then you provide an optional parameter, subject name, and then it will go filter the list of certificates that are available on your machine and uh, tell the DSC service to use that. So now you've got complete end-to-end -end service. I did find a couple of issues with X website as I was working this out, so I'll be submitting those as well, uh, notably on, on key, on data, on, on parameter types. So. All of that will end up on my repo as well. Uh, like I said, this evening I'll get those checked in during the hackathon. You're welcome to, to include that in the development effort this evening if you want. And uh, we'll get those into the production resource kit. So this last one, and we have three minutes and that's probably all I need. Um, so this is really a prototype. This is more of an idea than anything. There, there's code that you can go get right now and test it. Uh, but this was really Sean Gibbs and I sitting down and asking what if and then building something to prove that it works. Uh, and it came out really cool and we went to Jeffrey and said, what should we do with this? And he said, that is really cool. What do you want to do with it? He said, how about we just make it an open source project and wait and see if people like it? And he said, great, go do it. Uh, so the idea was, what if you could just author websites in PowerShell? Uh, you can do that with Ruby and you can do that with Python. There's really no reason why you couldn't do it with PowerShell. I mean, you can generate HTML in anything you want. So, you know, what would it look like if you did that in PowerShell? Uh, it's important to note that we weren't trying to tackle a specific problem. This was just a technology what if. Would this actually work? Uh, so it was like you've got hammers laying around but no nails. You're just hitting whatever comes to mind. Um, it was also interesting. We looked around and nothing was really able to do this natively. So. Uh, this was actually like, you know, end of the day conversation on Friday and Monday morning, Sean IM me and said, hey, I wrote that IIS handler. What are you talking about? It's like, yeah, yeah, you can render, you know, just websites out of PowerShell now. Like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, so I'll Tarantino this one as well. I'm just going to flip over. So if I switch to this, normally this is just get process output. Normally, the way I would have written this, I would have written a script to do get process. I would have made it a scheduled task. It would have created an HTM file, and then I would have just had IIS go look for that HTM file. Uh, oops. Dual monitors. <coughs> this is actually the code for this page. So IIS is just taking the HTML output from get process and rendering it directly. Um, if I switch over and look at something a little more fancy, uh, I am not a creative, artistically creative person. The worst thing you could do is give me a crayon and a blank sheet of paper and say draw something. I don't have any idea what I draw. So I'm a terrible web developer also. I just kind of put this together. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool about this, let's see, I'm gonna have to, I need fewer monitors. It's all right. PowerShell ASP. Yeah, similar. So uh, PowerShell ASP would be running the scripts in line. Uh, this is actually running PowerShell as the code. Um, I, I'll, I'll, offline, I can do this this evening, but I was going to show if I just drop another picture into that folder and hit refresh, then it magically shows up. So why is that? Like everything PowerShell, the value is in the module. Uh, so this is, I named it HTTP, I should have named it HTML. This is just a module that goes and creates 
uh, HTML for you, but it makes it really simple. So if I want a horizontal rule, I just add it. If I want to add a title, I can just assign it via style, uh, add text, add div, add link. So that more fancy looking web page just looks like this. So I just load in the module. I'm actually zoomed in too far for this. Oh, I can just do this. So it was kind of interesting how many times invoke commands uh, was helpful here. I never would have guessed that divs and invoke commands goes really well together. But anytime within that page I need to create a container construct, I would just say, okay, well that's just an invoke command. So my page is just a bunch of divs that go together. So open that script block. And then now I want my header. Okay, well that's an invoke command. Add title, <laughs> give it a style, add text. You can see anything that was like a, a property of that HTML tag is just a parameter of the commandlet. Uh, and then I just hand that off to the add div. And then I say, okay, the next time I create a div, I've got some additional properties, uh, <coughs> I've got some text, and then anything that's in that folder that's an image, I just want to put on this web page. So anything that you find that's a JPEG, add the image, uh, set the width. And then I've got a sidebar as well. So anything that's another PowerShell script that's just going to be a page that renders another page within my portal, go find that and put it on the menu bar because that's just the sidebar. Uh, so that's the idea. So this is also on GitHub. Uh, it's the same link. Just uh, actually, I'll switch back over to my slides because this is the end of the presentation. Hit this button to kill it off. All right, cool, good deal. Uh, that's the end of the demo. Let me.